Welcome, Shabbat Shalom. So happy to have you here. We're going to have a huge lesson today, so I hope you're ready to rock. Um, let's pray. Father, we just praise you and thank you and bless you for this Shabbat that you've given us and for this time and this place where we can come together and study your word. And we pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit will just speak to each of our hearts and um, teach us the things that you would have us to know and go out and teach other people. And we love you and we give you this morning and we ask these things in your name, Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Okay, so I would like you, we're going to start out on almost the back page. Go ahead and turn to page 17. And we're going to start out what's going to look like the end, but it really is going to be the beginning for us. All right, so you're going to see on page 17 a verse. Exodus 2, 2, and let's read it together. And the woman conceived and what? Bear a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. Okay, this son was Moses, right? But what we need to remember is Yeshua is going to be like Moses, Everybody remember that? There's a verse that says it. Okay, so this son is going to ultimately lead the people into the land, but he had to be hidden for a time. This is foreshadowing Yeshua, who is hidden from the Jewish people for a time. Moses would be hidden, but suddenly he would show up to lead his people to freedom, right? He wasn't just hidden for three months in that little Teva ark. He was hidden for 80 years. Remember, he was sent out into the desert for 40 years after he killed the Egyptian. He was hidden for a long time before he was finally sent back in to free the people. Well, Likewise for Yeshua, he's been hidden for a long time from his people, but he's about to show up and reveal his true identity. And like we pray in the Amidah, and gather us from the four corners of the earth. Okay, so this is the mindset I want you to see when you read that verse. There's a lot in it that doesn't just jump out on the surface but it's all hidden in there. All right, now let's go to Exodus 6, 8, and 9. And I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Moses relayed this message to the Israelites, but on account of their what? Broken spirit, which is ruach, and cruel bondage, which is Mikotzer, they did not listen to him. Everybody got those underlined words? Say them out loud. They did not listen to him. All right, this is what I want you to learn today. Ruach is this Hebrew word, and it's breath or spirit. When we say Ruach HaKodesh, that's the Holy Spirit. But this says ruach in that verse, and mikotzer is anguish. Okay, so what does this mean? This, when, when those two words are used in proximity like that, that is an idiom that means spiritual asthma. Okay, they couldn't breathe. They were spiritually stunted. Why? They couldn't hear the Holy Spirit anymore. That's what this means. They were so under bondage, they had such anguish that they started to identify themselves with the anguish. They forgot who they were as the people of God. Do you see how that could happen in the days that are coming to believers? We have got to learn from this. We can't get spiritual asthma. It's on. So whatever we do, we identify ourselves as children of God. 
regardless of how difficult the times may get, we don't want to get spiritual asthma and not be able to hear the Holy Spirit. That's how serious this verse is. And so any comments or questions about that? Is that a whole new idea? Spiritual asthma? Yes. Can you come out of spiritual asthma? Can you what? Can the Holy Spirit bring you out of it? Yes, absolutely. Who, and who brought them out? Who brought the people out of the spiritual asthma? Moses. And we've got to look to Yeshua to do that and ask the Holy Spirit to hear his voice. So, all right. Now let's go to the first page of the lesson. Okay, so today we're going to concentrate on one phrase, which is son of David. All right, last week we looked at what? Son of Abraham. So it's important to know that Matthew wrote to a Jewish audience to show that Yeshua is the long-awaited Messiah of the Jews and that he is the king of the Jews. Therefore, the first person listed in Matthew is David, emphasizing Yeshua's kingly and Jewish lineage. Everybody got that? Okay, Matthew begins with David, and the second person in Matthew's genealogy is Abraham, firmly establishing Yeshua's Jewish roots. Matthew calls attention to both. Today we take a look at the genealogy of David and see the truly incredible hand of the Lord at work. No mere man could ever have arranged this amazing genealogy. Last week we learned that a son is like someone. He has somebody's characteristics. It doesn't have to necessarily be a birth child. It can be a child who is like you in some way or several ways. You have children like that probably or friends who you'd call your son just because they're so much like you. Okay, today we're going to look at another aspect of being a son. When you are speaking of a son in scripture, you're looking for the fullness or for the potential of the one being spoken of. Okay, so when you look at the fullness they're going to bring to a family or the fullness they bring to a position. Okay, they're going to complete it. So a son has all these aspects to him. I don't? Yay. Okay. Okay. So I want you to get that perspective and to, as we go through these verses, to see how Yeshua brought fullness to the son as to being the son of David. All right. How will Yeshua be the son of David? Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6 says, Behold, and look for the words in this verse that should pop out. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now, this is his name by which he will be called. What is it? Okay. Had that happened yet in Jeremiah? So there wasn't a total fullness yet that had been brought to this promise. But then in Romans 3.22, it says, Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for how many? all who of those who believe for there is no distinction okay abraham believed god and it was counted to him as righteousness when matthew mentions the son of david name the ways that the above verse connected yeshua and messiah the king do you see how they connected did he did yeshua bring fullness because it says even the righteousness of God is what we have through faith in Jesus Christ for all. That was the promise that was coming from Jeremiah. And in Romans, we see it fulfilled. Yeshua brought fullness to that promise. Okay, now in the next verse in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, let's look for some key words as we read. 
For unto us a child is born, and unto us a what? Son, Son is given. And what's going to be upon his shoulders? Okay, and his name is going to be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon what? And upon his kingdom to order it and establish it with what? And justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Okay, so how many of you in this room would like justice today? <laughs> Even in our government. Do you think it's time? I think the whole world is getting ready to just yearn for this justice because we know it's not there. Okay, but Corinthians tells us, but by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. And John 5, 27 says, and he gave him what? Glory. To what? Execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. So Isaiah is connecting David's throne with the Son, who's going to execute judgment. So when are we going to see real justice? When Yeshua returns, right? That's when we're going to see it. So if, if your heart is really yearning for justice, then at the same time, it has to be yearning for the return of Messiah because that's what's going to bring justice. The rulers on the earth today, are they going to bring justice? Not the ones we're looking at, right? No way. Okay, so... Psalm 78, 70 says, He chose who? His servant from? He brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people. Israel is his inheritance. With upright heart, he shepherded them and guided them with his skillful hand. And then Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my what? So what aspect did you see? Yeshua fulfilling that David started out with. He has that shepherd's heart. So here we can see the branch of righteousness who is a king fulfilled. We can see that the heart of a shepherd is also what David portrayed and Yeshua brings fullness to. It's pretty incredible. All right, let's go to, uh, I don't know what page you're on. My notes are a little different, so, all right. And Matthew continues with more members of Yeshua's family, which will come back and link to David again, but now the story gets a little dicey. Matthew 1, 2, and 3. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Okay, there's some things we want to look at. Hezron was a leader of the tribe of Judah when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt. And Ram, or Ram, however you want to say it, means high or exalted, and he was also a leader from guess which tribe? Judah. Judah. And it, it also is stated that he was a friend of Job, so he had some age on him. Ram, yeah. So I, I'm wondering, and I'm wondering if you're wondering, why is Judah mentioned so many times and the other brothers are left out? Did that even cross your mind? If you look back through, it's Judah, 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 everything's about Judah. Let's read Genesis 49, 8 through 11, and we're going to see some things. Okay, you are he, he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey. My son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion and as a lion who shall rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, 
nor a lawgiver from between his feet until who comes? Yes. It's not, is it on the, sup it's on the supplement. It's on the supplement. Everybody got it? Yeah. Okay. All right. So already in this verse, I'll tell you, Judah has been mentioned two times. He's compared to a lion. And now we're at the um, high, dark highlighted letters that are underlined until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. All right, so number one, what tribe is Yeshua going to come from? Judah. Judah. That's why there's so much emphasis on, on this tribe. And number two, Shiloh is another name for Messiah. So if you go back in that verse and read it with Messiah in there, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until who comes? Messiah. Messiah, Messiah comes. And to him shall be obedience to, of the people. All right. So those two things we wanted to point out. And what did Yeshua ride in to Jerusalem on a donkey and donkeys are so incredibly used in scripture I wish that we had time to go through just a study on donkeys it it's <laughs> unbelievable but right now this is the incredible thing a donkey is one that the Lord wrote in on and in Hebrew it's Hamor and Ham Homer is material or flesh. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Hamor is a donkey. Homer is material or flesh. And you see how extremely similar <clears throat> those words are. It's because they're almost interchangeable. But what they really mean is a donkey points to the material or fleshly nature. All right? It's always about that in some way. A donkey is cleansing through affliction. So if it's a fleshly thing, what's, what's our flesh always going through, it seems like? Are, is anybody in here in a trial right now? If you are, raise your hand. <laughs> Only one? <laughs> <laughs> what a great group to be in then. Yeah. All right. Well, okay. So I think we're almost always in some kind of affliction, are we not? Yes. I don't know. Do you have trouble putting your flesh where it should be? Yeah. Is it constantly just easy for you to be everything that the Lord told us we should be? No. It takes affliction for us to get into those right places. And that's what this is talking about. So if you're riding on a donkey, what does it say in the word? That Yeshua, though a son, son, he learned obedience by the things he suffered. He went through constant affliction, Yeshua. So every hand that went up in here or every hand that has ever struggled with their flesh or might in the future, you're in good company. Even Yeshua had to suffer in his flesh. But the cool thing is he rode on the donkey. He was on top of it. He had conquered the flesh and continued to conquer even though the, that he had affliction because he rode on the donkey. And that's our goal. We want to ride on the donkey. We don't want the donkey riding on us. That's the whole thing. So every time you see donkey in the Bible, look at it through this, this lens. It's really incredible. Okay, so look at Revelation 5, 5 and 6. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah and the who? Of David 
has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a what? As though it had been slain. You have redeemed us to God by your blood. Do you see all the connections in Revelation 5 and, five and 6 to Genesis 49, 8 through 11? They're everywhere. He's, so this lion that's described in Genesis is now going to open the scroll. And how was his flesh afflicted? How do we see the affliction in this verse? We see the affliction in this verse because he, he, the lion of the tribe of Judah, had to become the lamb that was slain. That's affliction. That is true affliction. That's why he could ride that donkey. Okay? So do you see the fulfillment as a son in this verse? And the humility, this hopelessly unable to help itself lamb is slain. He is the lion but he became the lamb and he afflicted his flesh so that we could be grafted in and called righteous. Pretty incredible stuff. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at Judah the man and we're going to read this story. I think you're going to find it interesting. I'm sure you've all read it before, but it's worth a reread. Genesis 38, at that time Judah left his brothers and went down to stay with a man of Adullam named Hira. There Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua. He married her and made love to her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son who was named Ur. She conceived again and gave birth to a son named Onan. She gave birth to still another son and named him Shelah. It was at Kizib that she gave birth to him. Judah got a wife for Ur his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord. So what, what did he do? He put him to death. Who killed him? The Lord. the Lord. Then Judah said to Onan, Sleep with your brother's wife and fulfill your duty to her as a brother-in-law to raise up offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the child would not be his. So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he spilled his semen on the ground to keep from providing offspring for his brother. Okay. What he did was wicked in the Lord's sight. So what happened? Oh boy. Judah then said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, live as a widow in your father's household until my son Sheila grows up. For he thought he may die too just like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's household. Wh who was Judah blaming for the death of these sons? Tamar. Who? Tamar. 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 But who was really <laughs> killing? Yeah. After a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. Then when Judah had recovered from his grief, he went up to Timnah to the men who were shearing his sheep and his friend Hiram, the Adulamite, went with him. When Tamar was told, your father-in-law is on his way to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's clothes, covered herself with a veil to disguise herself, then sat at the entrance to Enaim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that, though Sheila had grown up, she had not been given to him as his wife. So the problem is obvious. Who hadn't kept his word? Judah. When Judah saw her, he, he, uh, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. Not realizing that she was his daughter-in-law, he went to her by the roadside and said, Come now, let me sleep with you. And what will you give me to sleep with you? She asked. I'll send you a young goat from my flock, he said. Will you give me something as a pledge until you send it? She asked. He said, what pledge should I give you? Your seal and cord and the staff in your hand, she answered. So he gave them to her and slept with her, and she became pregnant by him. And she left. <clears throat> she took off her veil and put on her widow's clothes again. 
How would you describe Tamar's actions up to this point? <laughs> what? Sneaky? Yeah. Yeah. She, devious. All of the above. Yeah. Nevertheless, she knew. Nevertheless, Judah. Judah had a little problem, too. <laughs> and she knew. <laughs> okay, so there are things we could say. All right, uh, so here we go. Meanwhile, Judah sent the goat, the young goat, by his friend, the Adulamite, in order to get his pledge back from the woman, but he did not find her. He asked the men who lived there, where is the shrine prostitute who was beside the road at Enaim? There hasn't been any shrine prostitute here, they said. So he went back to Judah and said, I didn't find her. Besides, the men who lived there said, there hasn't been a shrine prostitute here. Then Judah said, let, let her keep, Ken, where were you? Let her keep what she has, or we will become a laughing stock. After all, I did send her this young goat, but you didn't find her. About three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law, Tamar, is guilty of prostitution, and as a result, she is now pregnant. Judah said, bring her out here and have her burned to death. As she was being brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law. I am pregnant by the man who owns these, she said. And she added, see if you recognize whose seal and cord and staff these are. Uh, Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I because I wouldn't give her to my son, Sheila. Okay. <clears throat> Here's the amazing thing. Yes, Deb. It should be in the drawer. Okay. Okay, so the amazing thing is, <coughs> do Judah and Tamar are in the line of Yeshua. It's incredible. And a woman without a husband was like nothing. You had no way to make a living. You, you really were just in poverty. She was living with her father but at his house. But yes, it would have been extremely difficult. But, and I agree, and look what the Lord does. Look what he does. Okay. Well, something else we need to look at. Were there problems in this family? I'd, I'd say they were pretty dysfunctional, right? On all sides, maybe. When you have problems in your family, how does knowing Yeshua's family had problems help you? We shouldn't feel surprised when these things come upon us, whether it's, you know, un, an unexpected pregnancy or anything else that we deal with with our families. And it can be, you know, unending problems. But... Yeshua has a way of solving these things and of bringing righteousness to a situation, and that's what we're going to see, okay? So, Matthew 1.3, Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Okay, though these children were brought into this world by less than upright circumstances, their names are connected to the Messiah, Zerah means dawning or light or shining. And Peretz means breaker or one who breaks open. <coughs> Excuse me. So I want to look at some examples in the word with you. And we want to look at this word Peretz because that's the word that means to break open or the breaker. Okay. So what does it say in 2 Samuel 6, 8? And see if there's a, a familiar name in this story that we're going to look at. Then David, there he is, was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out. And that's the word parats, a breach, parets, against who? And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah because something broke out against Uzzah. And what was it? Do you remember? He touched the ark. He touched the ark. And, and what happened? Was the Lord happy about it? No. What does that verse call um, what the Lord had? 
wrath, yes, the Lord's wrath poretzed against Uzzah. So that was not a happy situation. Okay, who else is involved in this story? 2 Samuel 5.20. So David went to Baal, Perazim, that's a plural for Peretz, where he defeated the Philistines and said, like a bursting, that's again Peretz, like a bursting flood, the Lord has burst out against my enemies before me. So he called that place Baal Perazim. Okay, so what happened here? Who's the one who is bursting out? Look at the verse. The Lord. It's the Lord again. Are we getting a pattern here? Okay, let's look at 1 Chronicles 14, 11. So David and his men went up to Baal Perazim, the place where he had burst out, where he defeated the Philistines and said, like a bursting, Peretz, flood, God has burst out, Peretz, against my enemies by what? By my hand. How did Yeshua overcome his enemies? He spread out his hands and let them be nailed to a cross, right? And what is David saying here? Against my enemies, by what? My hand. What does that tell you? God could do everything all by himself, right? He didn't, he, could he have killed Goliath? Could God have thrown a rock down from heaven and yeah but but who came along and said I'll kill that giant the little boy David right he could have God could have done it what is this telling you yes God wants to work with you he wants to work with you he doesn't want to do everything solo Yeshua came to do his will. He, by his hand, he brought salvation. Now we're here to do what he did. Remember, Yeshua said, go and do what I did and greater things you will do. And he met that. This is a very Jewish way of thinking. And a lot of times we believers think that we can pray and just let God do everything wrong. That's why he gave us hands and feet and a mouth and ears and eyes and everything else that we have and giftings. And we are to go out and do what he did. By my hand, David said. Yes, God burst out, but David went and fought in the flesh. How do we fight? What are our weapons? We can speak, right? We have spiritual weapons and even our bodies. I mean... Though we constantly fight to keep our flesh in order, we also, our flesh is the only thing that can do good. Do you see that? That's why we have bodies. Let the good overcome the affliction. Let the affliction help you do good. Because by the affliction, you have a testimony that you can go out and help other people. Whatever it is that the Lord puts in your mind. Is this a new concept? Uh, it kind of is. I know. It, it's, it, you know, in. Okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> so, more about Peretzin. Let's look at Micah 2, 13 and, uh, 12 and 13. I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep of the fold like a flock in the midst of their pasture. They shall make a loud noise because of so many people. The one who what? Will come where? Before them. They will break out, pass through the gate, and go out by it. Their king will pass before them with the Lord at their head. So who broke out in the open? Who broke them out? The Lord, the Lord, he's the poor retzer. Is he the poor retzer? Has he been the poor retzer in all of these verses? Yes, 
Okay, and who is all of you, O Jacob? What is that referring to? Who, what people? Israel. Israel. And to what are the people being compared? Sheep. sheep. They're being compared to sheep. And who else compared us to sheep? Yeshua. Yeshua. Okay, so eight, uh, question number 18 says, Then he who is coming, and what will this one do? What will the sheep do at this point? Who, what's this one who is coming going to do? He will lead them out. He's going to lead them out. Exactly. All right. Sheep who are led out of an enclosure where they have been crowded together all night, push and shove to get out of the gate that the shepherd has opened in the morning. They all want to be the first to get to the tender grass and open spaces. That's a typical sheep's attitude. They don't want to be afflicted. I'm not going to the back of the line. Watch out. Let me go first, right? This is a picture of people who are pushing and shoving to get into heaven. Often the shepherd himself laid down across the threshold of the door to the sheep enclosure to protect the sheep. Yeshua describes himself as the door of the sheep, John 10, 7. So Jesus said to them again, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Isn't that amazing? All right, now we're going to see this in a chiastic order. And I'm just going to assume that you all know what a chiasm is. And if you don't, you're going to learn right now. All right, so you have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. That verse is broken into six lines. Everybody see that? They're in bold. All right, if you take the first one and the last one, it, it will say this. The one, this is going to tell you who is doing this. The one who breaks open, is that Poretz? Yes, will come up before them. So who is that, the one that breaks open? Six is going to tell you, with the Lord at their head. So who's the one that's going to break open? The Lord. They will break out. This is line two. Now that's going to uh, go with line five their king will pass before them. So again, who is their king? The Lord. And three and four, they're going to pass through the gate and go out by it. So Matthew, so what is this telling us? What's it telling us? Who's at the head? It's the Lord. He's the one that breaks through. But by David's hand, right? It's another thing, it's another sign that he's the son of David. He's from the tribe of Judah. He's from the lineage of David. The Messiah will break through with light. That's the other twin, Zerah. So Poretz breaks through. He's a type of Messiah. And Zerah says he's coming with light. Pretty incredible. What God birthed out of a really touchy situation which we can see all kinds of issues with, right? So is there hope for your family? Yes. So by our hands, may we help it. May we afflict our flesh and do whatever need we can do to bring peace, right? Okay. So Matthew 1, 2 through 6, Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Amminadab, and Amminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. And there is David the king in the line of Peretz who would burst through, and Zerah, whose name means dawning or shining one. And did you notice the names of the women in the verse? I have only four minutes left, he said. Okay. Did you notice the names? Rahab, Ruth, and Tamar. What do, you, what do these women have in common? 
<laughs> they were not Jews. Are there Gentiles in the line of Yeshua? Oh my goodness. Were all these women upright women? No, but there is redemption. Pretty amazing. Okay. So Matthew 1.17 says, So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are how many? 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon and to Christ are 14 generations. The gematria of the Hebrew name David. Do I have that up here? No. Okay, but it's right on your sheet. So the dalit is four. You can fill it in if you'd like. The Vav is six, and the Dalit again, which means David. That's how you spell David's name. Dalit, Vav, Dalit. If you add those, if the gematria of those letters up, it is 14. So it's unbelievable. And what is this telling us? The son of David would come in this generation. Matthew is giving us math to prove when he would come the first time. Pretty incredible, and, the, and even David's name testifies to this. There are no consequences. It's unbelievable the uh, planning that went into everything that we have studied today. All right, so what are you going to take away today? What's one thing that you can remember from this class? There's hope for us, yes. What else? What do you think of God when you think of this? God is able. Merciful. God is able. He is merciful. Yes. He's what about our... He what? He bursts through. But how do we fit in? We work with him. We work with him. Yes. We don't just sit there. We, do, we pray, which is a lot, but we do more than pray. We get physically active. Go out and be like Messiah is. That's why we're here. Anything else that you want to share? Some insight that you got along the way? <laughs> One more minute. Okay. What about the donkey? Oh, no. <laughs> Don't let the donkey ride you. <laughs> All right. You're all great. I, I love that you're here. It's wonderful to study with you. Have a blessed Shabbat. Thank you. Thank you.